Between the 15th century, when Portugal became the first European nation to take significant part in African slave trading, and 1807, when the transatlantic slave trade was abolished, European ships carted millions of people away from Africa. In total, European ships took over 11 million people into slavery from the West African coast alone. This odious trade made Europe grow rich on, on, on the profits while the populations of Africa uh, was uh, devastated. By the 1870s, only 10% of the continent was under direct European control, with um, Algeria held by France, the Cape Colony, and um, Natal, both in modern-day South Africa, held by uh, the British, and Angola by Portugal. However, by 1900, Europeans were ruling more than 90% of the African continent. European nations had added almost 10 million square miles of Africa, one-fifth of the landmass of the globe, to their overseas colonial possessions. Just how did this happen? Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Please subscribe and turn on your notification buttons if you haven't. And um, also, please, please, please support us by pledging a token amount to this channel through Patreon so we can continue to bring you videos like this one. And no amount, no amount that you pledge is too small. We, we, we appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Now, inevitably, the scramble for territory in Africa by European con uh, governments led to conflict among, a conflict among them, particularly between the British and the French in West Africa and Egypt. The British also fell out with the Portuguese in East Africa and the French and the barbaric Leopold II disputed Central Africa. Rivalry between Great Britain and France led Otto von Bismarck of Germany to intervene and in, in, and in, the late, in, in late 1884, he called a meeting of European powers in Berlin. So in a nutshell, the scramble for Africa happened. <laughs> One of the justifications which European colonizers gave for the partitioning of Africa was that it would help to stamp out slave trade. According to one of the most celebrated explorers of Africa, David Livingstone, there was a need for a worldwide crusade to defeat the slave trade controlled by Arabs in East Africa. Livingstone, like other Europeans, believed in the innate superiority of Europeans over the lesser races of the world. He therefore advocated that the only way to liberate Africa was to introduce the three C's, commerce, Christianity, and civilization. The belief that Euro Europeans needed to civilize Africa stems from the unscientific notion that Europeans belonged to a superior white race, one superior white, that they all belong to one superior white race, which originated in the Caucasus, which is where the term Caucasian comes from. Now, this idea was first postulated by Johann Blumenbach, a German professor of ethnology at the turn of the 19th century. Blumenbach's color-coded classification of races as white, brown, yellow, black, and red was later refined by a French ethnologist, Joseph Arthur Gabinou, 
and um, his um, he he refined it by including a complete racial hierarchy, which had white-skinned people of European origin at the top, and everyone else. You know, populating the bottoms with the with the dark-skinned people at the lowest rung. Other Europeans, like David Livingstone, believed in these pseudo-scientific theories and assumed that they had a duty to civilize Africans. The Berlin Conference, held between eighteen eighty four and eighteen eighty five as I said, was convened by Otto van Bismarck, who was the founder and first chancellor of the German Empire. The Berlin Conference was the climax of the European competition for territory in Africa. It was a process of negotiating who would own what part of the continent. So that process is what is commonly known as the scramble for Africa. The real motivation for the scramble was actually that during the 1870s and early 1880s, European nations, including Great Britain, France, and Germany, needed to look to Africa for natural resources for their growing industrial sectors, as well as a potential market for the goods that their factories uh, were producing. As a result of this, governments were desperate to safeguard their commercial interests in Africa. As we have seen in our episode on the decline of Africa's golden age, Europe was encountering a general downturn in productivity and economic growth when Africa prospered. The 14th century was a period of major famines and a a crisis in the agricultural sector in Europe, which had not yet become industrialized. Please make time to watch that episode if you missed it. From about 1320, there was a famine every 10 years. Food became scarce. Epidemics such as the Black Plague, typhoid, dysentery, smallpox, etc. hit European populations periodically between 1313 and 1348. There was therefore an increase in mortality and a drop in birth. C citizens grappled with very poor standards of living with limited nutrition and health problems. As such, most monarchs in Europe who had been looking for sources of wealth invested in mercenaries to go and look for resources to help their kingdom survive. And uh, Africa, uh, 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 Asia, and the Americas were places that European explorers targeted. Since then, European governments had continued to send mercenaries and encourage missionaries to the African continent. They at first tried to get slaves themselves uh, using superior arms and ammunitions. We did not quite succeed. They then developed a system of colluding with indigenous rulers or the supposed representatives of the people. So, so they got these people to help foment wars and unrest so that slaves could be captured, sold to them, and then transported through the transatlantic slave trade. Now, the avowed purpose of the Berlin Conference was to discuss the future of Africa and the stamping out of slavery because most European countries had become industrialized and so they no longer needed as much manual labor as they needed when they depended on, uh, on slave trade. So an act was signed at the conference in Berlin. It's known as the Berlin Act of uh, 1885 by 13 European powers, 
which had a resol- and the, the the act had a re- resolution to st- to help in the suppressing of slavery so while on the surface the stamping out of uh, slavery sounds like a laudable venture in reality the major strategic and economic objective of the european countries was how to protect their old interests, trades and markets in Africa, and how to exploit new ones. As I, 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 I said, uh, this was in the light of the Industrial Revolution. We did not require as much human labor as slave trade had provided. So the Berlin Conference, therefore, started the process of carving up Africa and putting up borders to suit European interests without taking into consideration the cultural or ethnic components of of Africa. For example, Britain was primarily concerned with maintaining its lines of communication with India, uh, its jewel in the crown. Hence, its interest in Egypt and South Africa that was the, the reason why Britain was interested in holding on power in Egypt and South Africa was to open because of the lines of communication between the African continent and India through those places. But once these two areas were secured, imperialist adventures like Cecil Rhodes encourage the acquisition of further territory with the intention of establishing a Cape to Cape, uh, a Cape to Cairo uh, railway. That is, railway lines uh, stemming from uh, from uh, Cape uh, Cape Coast in, in, in southern Africa to uh, to Cairo in Egypt towards the north. So Britain was also interested in the commercial potential of mineral-rich territories like the Transvaal, where gold was discovered in the mid-1880s. And so Britain was determined to prevent other European powers, particularly Germany and France, from muscling into areas which Britain considered within their sphere of its influence. As a result... During the last 20 years of the 19th century, British occupied, Britain occupied or annexed Egypt, the Sudan, British East Africa, uh, that is Kenya and Uganda, British Somalia, Southern and Northern Rhodesia, that is Zimbabwe and Zambia, Bechuana land, which is uh, Botswana, Orange Free State, and the Transvaal, both in uh, South Africa, Um, Gambia, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, British Gold Coast, which is modern-day Ghana, and Nyasa land, which is uh, Malawi. These countries accounted for more than 30% of Africa's population, and all of them were uh, were taken over by the British. The other chief colonizers of Africa were France, Germany, Belgium, Italy, uh, Portugal, and Spain. Germany, which had only been unified in 1871, acquired German Southwest Africa, which is present-day Namibia in 1884, an attempt by the Herero and Nama owners of the area to free themselves from the stranglehold of Germany in 1904, and this stranglehold was provoked by the brutality of uh, the German settlers, met with unmentionable violence, which left tens of thousands of Hiroro uh, and Nama men, women, and children exterminated. Please take the time to check out our episode or the Namibian genocide, if you have not yet watched it. It was a horrib- horrific, you know, um, part of human history, which we need to always keep in mind. Because uh, re- reparation hasn't been made. Now, similarly, 
Leopold II of Belgium, who aspired to increase his personal wealth by acquiring African territory, hired agents to lay claim to vast tracts of land in Central Africa. In subsequent meetings, Britain, France, Germany, Portugal, and Leopold II of Belgium negotiated their claims to African territories, which were then formalized and mapped out according to their interests. During the conference, these European leaders also agreed to allow free trade among the colonies. They then established a framework for negotiating future European claims in Africa. Neither the Berlin Conference itself nor the framework for future negotiations allowed any African people to have a say about the partitioning of their homelands. While the Berlin Conference did not initiate European colonization of Africa, it legitimated and formalized the process. In addition, it sparked new unhealthy interests in Africa. After the conference, European powers expanded their claims in Africa so that by 1900, European states had claimed nearly 90% of African uh, territory. An upshoot of the uh, Berlin Conference was that Leopold avowed that he would stamp out Arab slavery in return for the right to tax imports. However, rather than stamp out slavery, his agents in the Congo used forced labor in ways that were even more dastardly than slavery to extract rubber, which was his single most profitable export at the time. By 1902, rubber sales had risen 15 times in eight years and were valued at 41 million francs. Leopold and his agents were able to enforce labor by taking the women um, of Congolese villages hostages. They held them hostage. Now, this allowed him to turn the men into forced laborers with a monthly quota of wild rubber that they must collect, you know, from the rainforest. Uh, the system was really harsh. Many hostages starved to death and many men were forced to walk themselves to death. Attempts to rebel were met with brutal forces and more people were brutally killed. Demographers today estimate that the population of the Congo fell by about half over the 40-year period beginning around 1880. The truth behind the Congo's con uh, rubber trade um, or legalized uh, robbery enforced by violence was finally exposed by one Edmond Morel, an Anglo-French uh, shipping clerk who wrote a series of accusing articles in the speaker in uh, 1900. The rest of Europe, especially those who signed the Berlin Act, simply looked on until a connection. They simply looked on. They did not raise a finger. They were not going to do anything to try and stop the carnage that Leopold was unleashing on the Congo. They, the only time they now paid attention was when a connection was made between Leopold and the um, Leopold II, between what Leopold II was doing in the Congo and the effect on the economic interests 
of um, other European uh, countries. Uh, so until it was exposed by this article written by Edmond Morel, who argued that um, Leopold's illegal state uh, monopoly was robbing uh, uh, merchants in, in, in Britain that um, any uh, interest was uh, any attention was paid for what was going on so this now spurred britain into action and a british consul uh, roger casement was sent to investigate the situation in the congo the report of the investigation which came out in 1904 was then used to force leopold's hands now, so in 1908, Leopold was forced to hand over control of the Congo to the Belgian states in return for 3. Point, um, I think it was 3.8 million pounds. However, his hand uh, this handover did not really improve the situation of the Africans in the Congo. Um, because whilst previously um, Leopold II had been running the Congo like his, as his own personal business, it was then handed over to his country, Belgium, in the hope that you know, the, uh, the treatment of the Congolese would not be so inhumane. You know? But it did make much of a difference. Um, so this handover it did not improve the situation of the Africans in the Congo because the forced labor system continued. And even during World War I, forced labor now took another form when tens of thousands of Congolese were conscripted as porters for the Belgian army. But a lot of um, scholars actually believe that they just called them porters, that in actual fact, that they were used as cannon fodder. Now, the forced labor system did not change significantly until the early 1920s, when Belgian colonial authorities realized that the population was dropping so rapidly that they would they soon might not have any more labor uh, labor force there to work with. So, but forced labor remained in place under the colonial powers, the various colonial powers, well into the 1940s. Sadly, even today, slavery is not unknown in Africa, particularly in countries such as the Sudan, where law and order are often absent. And um, so, no, have the, col uh, the colonists ever really gone away? White-owned businesses still dominate the mining of Africa's most valuable natural resources, particularly gold, diamonds, cobalt, you know, what have you. The continent has never stopped being plundered. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the Sankofa Pan-African series channel. Like our videos and please share them with your contacts.